So in the study of mechanics and materials, uh, there's a few things that we deal with a lot. Uh, one of them is stress, and that's kind of what we've been focusing on uh, more so for the uh, you know, recent lectures that we've done. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, parameter that's known as strain. Uh, strain deals with kind of the deformation of the material as opposed to dealing with maybe how close you are to breaking the piece of material. Okay? But stress and strain are related to each other, uh, as we are familiar with a little bit from our, our previous courses. Uh, we have these uh, elastic parameters, the modulus of elasticity, the modulus of rigidity, and Poisson's ratio. Those are elastic parameters that basically allow us to make relationships between stress and strain based on uh, material properties. Right? So for a particular type of material, those properties tend to be relatively constant for, for at least for many types of material uh, that are out there. So what we're going to look at today is the idea that just like we could transform stresses uh, into new coordinate systems, uh, we can also transform strains into new coordinate systems. And so I'm going to do a little uh, demonstration here or kind of a little derivation showing how you can actually get that done. What we start with is uh, a little element of material. That's where we start with a lot of these discussions, right? The little element of material. And we are working in plane here, OK? So this is kind of a, we're, we're in 2D for this little discussion that we're doing. Um, and we start with some original little uh, piece of material that is square in shape and um, you know, has a, a particular size to it based on different types of loads that might be applied to the material, it can then deform. Okay? So what you see here is the little gray square that we're starting with. Uh, that's the original piece. And then based on loads that are applied, that little square can expand in different directions, right? If for based on probably based primarily due to the normal stresses, it will maybe elongate in one direction or elongate in another direction. And then it can also deform by sort of skewing and become something that is no longer a square anymore. So it can become something that is more like a parallelogram. Okay? Um, the issue of just becoming larger in one dimension or the other dimension, that's typically due to something that's called uh, normal strain. And then the idea of the little element skewing, that's due to shearing strain. Okay? And so what we'll do here is we've defined uh, the dimensions of the original piece. Uh, we've defined those based on a little delta x, all right, that, uh, that this little piece of material started out having. Okay, that's the little size of the, the bottom piece. Um, and then delta y, uh, I don't know if I, oh yeah, there it is right there. We also have a little delta y that would be uh, the height of a little triangle that I cut off the bottom of the original piece. Okay? The reason I have this little triangle cut is this is what allows us to do the transformation. Right? We're going to do a transformation of strain based on this rotation angle uh, theta. Okay? So I'm, imagine here I'm uh, rotating my coordinate system uh, to x prime, y prime, and that's going to be rotated based on a coordinate of theta or the, the value of theta. Um, and so what you get out of this is a new triangle that has now you know, been deformed along a couple of different directions. All right. So let me discuss some of these parameters down here. So let's talk about this one right here. Okay. Delta x was the original length of that bottom portion of my transformation element. Right? That was the original length of that. Based on the idea that this element has now deformed, the new length of that becomes delta x times 1 plus the strain in the x direction. Why is that, you think? Let's actually take each piece. Delta x times 1, right? What, what does that give you? That just gives you what you originally had, right? And then you add to that delta x times epsilon x. What does that do for you? Okay. Sometimes this notation throws people off a little bit because I'm, when I say delta x, I'm not talking about a change of x. I'm just talking about this is a little piece of material that I'm using a delta x to talk about that original length. 
right? But we have an original length and we have a deformed length. So if I take an original length, which is the delta x, and I multiply it by strain, OK? Does anyone remember what the definition of strain was? OK, delta L over L. It's basically how much did it change in length divided by the original length. Well, if you take strain and multiply by original length, what do you get? Change in length, right? So basically what this does, the delta x times 1 plus epsilon x, that gives me my new length of that side. Tracking with me so far? OK. Same thing along this, uh, this side over here, right? Delta y was the original height of that little uh, triangular element right there. And uh, 1 plus epsilon y gives me the new length of that, uh, of that side. All right, good so far. What we're trying to do is figure out the strain now along that line. Okay, because that's my transformation into a new uh, position, right? Well, I can, just like I stated it down here, um, you know, at first, if delta s is the original length of the original line before it deforms, then I can define the uh, new length in terms of the strain along that line the same way that I defined the other values for my x direction and my y direction. Okay, does that make sense? So that's why I have the original length, delta s, which came from over here, times 1 plus the strain. And I actually am writing this as the strain as a function of this rotation angle, right? Because that's if, depending on what I make that rotation angle, it's going to have an effect on what I anticipate the strain will be along that uh, you know, aqua, aqua shaded line right there. We good so far? OK, what this sets up is a little triangle that we can evaluate the geometry on. All right, um, This is a little triangle. It is not a right triangle because the triangle has been skewed a little bit. Okay, I didn't talk about that yet, but let me let's take a second and do that. Notice this little value right here. I called it gamma xy. You might remember that notation from some earlier classes. What do you think I'm talking about with gamma xy? Okay. Kind of okay, it's the angle between the original shape of the element and this new shape of the element. It's almost an angle of skew is what it actually is geometrically. But we gave this thing a name back uh, a long time ago. This was a shearing strain. Okay. <laughs> So that's how much strain I'm talking about by this, this element skewing over just a little bit. Well, you'll notice there that because I started with a right angle right here, and then the element starts skewing over, that means that my new angle, um, you know, after it has begun to skew, is 90 degrees plus that little amount that it has skewed. Would you agree with that? OK. So I was about to start doing some you know, geometric analysis on this little uh, triangular element. And what I'm going to use is actually the law of cosines. Okay? And because the law of cosines is harder to see in the middle of this whole expression, let me do it in a little bit more simple way. Let's say this side was A. Let's say that side was B. And this side up here was C, just to make easy letters. Uh, the law of cosines would say that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of what? That angle, right? And so that angle is just going to be uh, 90 degrees plus gamma xy. Okay? So maybe that helps explain this a little bit, but that's where my very first equation comes from. You'll notice there that I take the new length um, of the side that I'm trying, you know, the transformed uh, direction side squared is equal to the new length of one side squared plus the new length of the other side squared minus two times 
uh, the length of one side times the length of the other side times the cosine 90 degrees plus gamma uh, xy. We good so far? All right. Let's do a couple of substitutions. Okay. Now these these are uh, one of the places where we need to. Uh, well, well, we'll get into this just a second. The first couple are not too hard, right? Delta x relates to delta s because I had that original right triangle, right? My original right triangle had uh, delta x as one side. It had delta y there as this other side, right? And so because my rotation angle is theta, then delta x is just equal to delta s cosine theta, OK? And same thing for y, right? Delta y is just equal to delta s sine theta, just based on that original right triangle that I started with, OK? Um, now, here's the place where we need to you know, be a little bit careful. Cosine of 90 degrees plus gamma xy, we can actually transform that 90 plus angle, right? We can actually turn that into an, a, a different trig function, right? So we can just turn that into a minus sine of gamma xy. Agree with that? So the, um, you know, whenever you have a complementary angle, basically, um, or add 90 degrees to an angle, you basically get over, because there's a 90 degree <laughs> shift between sine and cosine, right? So uh, that turns it into minus sine times gamma xy. And then um, this is the place where I need to talk about this just a little bit. Why can I say that minus sine of gamma xy is approximately equal to gamma xy? Right, so it's a small angle approximation. Where this comes from, if you actually think about it graphically, is uh, let's say that you had a set of axes, and let's say you were looking at a sine wave, right? What's the slope of the sine wave right there where it crosses, you know, right here where it crosses um, at basically zero angle, right? This would be an angle here, and this is just the outcome of the angle, uh, sine of the angle, right? What do you have there as far as slope right where it crosses at that location? Slope is 1. And so that means if you take tight enough limits, like a little bit to one side and a little bit to the other, since the slope right there is 1, it's close enough just to say that the angle is equal to the sine of the angle within that little range. The only little star I'd put on that is you do have to be measuring this in radians in order for that to work. Okay. All right, so that's a little small angle approximation. The next step involves just expanding all these little terms out, which is a, you know, just, just lovely algebra that we love to do. Okay, and when we do that, that's so I'm, I'm on this step right here. Okay, when we do that, we'll notice that we end up with a delta s squared term in every term of this. Uh, of this equation, OK? And because we've got that delta s squared term, I can actually cancel all of those out, OK? So that's uh, maybe the first thing that I would note. The next thing I would note is we're talking about these strain values. And remember, strain is a change in length divided by original length. How big is the change in length typically relative to an original length? In other words, what, what typically are the values of my, shear, of my, uh, my strains? They're usually really small, right? It's very unusual that you have a material like a rubber band or something where you can actually stretch it to double its original length or something. Most materials won't do that, right? Most materials will break far before you reach you know, doubling the length or something like that. So, Typically, it's assumed that these strain values are uh, very small relative to 1. And if they're small relative to 1, then that means that when we square them, they become even less significant. Right? So they're, they're already small. We square them, they become insignificant relative to the terms that are not squared. OK? And so. You might notice these little spots where I have the little green slash. Uh, 
uh, knocking out a few of these terms, right? There's one right here, there's one right here, and there's uh, other one right here where it's not squared, but it's two strain values multiplied by each other, okay? Those are very small relative to the other strain values that I'm dealing with here that are not squared, okay? And you might remember doing things like that um, back from when you were in calculus, where if you had higher order terms and you then took a limit, say, as, you know, as something got smaller and smaller, those higher order terms became less and less significant. Remember doing something like that? Okay, this works very similarly here. All right, so um, that gets me down into the next statement uh, that happens in my, in my derivation. And this next statement can also be simplified on a number of different grounds. And so let me kind of describe those. Uh, the first way that I want to describe this is with a trig identity, maybe the, the most commonly known trig identity, and that is sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to what? So sine squared of an angle plus cosine squared of that angle is equal to 1, right? What I want to show you here, I have 1 on one side of this expression, and I have cosine squared of theta and sine squared of theta that wind up you know, coming out in that expression. And so I can cancel those across that uh, equation and get rid of those. Okay, that's kind of the first step. Okay, the next step after those are gone, you might notice that every term in this expression, um, once those are gone, every term has a factor of two, right? So I'm gonna divide out that factor of two since it's on everything. And you might notice there's uh, a couple of more uh, higher order strain terms that now have popped out again, and so I can eliminate those as well, right? Gamma xy times epsilon x and gamma xy times epsilon y, those are higher order strain terms that I can cancel just like I did uh, for the other ones because those are uh, small relative to ones that are not higher order, okay? All right, once I have done all of those things, I end up with equation number one here, and this is the equation that I would use to transform a normal strain, okay? Um, I would transform normal strain from x to x prime, right? It's basically transforming a normal strain through an angle of theta, all right? And what I come up with is the strain that will act along this new direction. We good so far? Okay. Um, I can apply a couple of uh, trig identities, just like I did when we were looking at more circle for stress. I can apply some of these double angle uh, trig identities, and I can rewrite that expression uh, so that it actually has a form that looks more like my more circle form that I did for stress, right? You might remember that average of normal strains plus half the difference of my normal strains times the cosine of my transformation angle plus half of the shearing strain times the sine of, the, of two times the rotation angle, okay? What's the big difference between this expression and the one that we got when we did more circle for uh, stress? Okay, you might not remember this, but um, this term right here, okay? Do you remember what we had in that spot when we did our, uh, our question of more circle for stress? What's that? Okay, I, I had a shearing stress there. Did it divide by two? Okay, so this is, a, this is the big difference between more circle for strain and more circle for stress is that when we plot the uh, values of shearing strain, we don't plot the actual value, we plot half of the value, okay? And that's just because of how this formula wound up coming out, right? It ends up with this factor of two. So that means as, as long as we plot half of our uh, shearing strains, then it essentially behaves the same way as Moore's circle. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself just a little bit because I need to show 
uh, the other equation for my parametric equations, right? You might remember that from the discussion we had of Moore's circle. We got Moore's circle by basically developing two parametric equations and then plotting those, and it made a circle, OK? So let's do a little bit of work uh, in order to try to find my other equation that I need for my pair of parametric equations, OK? Um, all right, first question. Would you agree that um, if I plugged in uh, theta plus 90 degrees into theta, that would basically give me the strain along some new y prime direction instead of x prime direction? Okay. So basically what I'm doing there is, you imagine it this way. Let's say my original axes were like this, x and y. And I had my original uh, element oriented relative to x and y like that. And now I've moved to some new set of axes, x prime and y prime. OK. So that's where my element is now that I'm dealing with. I had a value here for, uh, for theta. That's my rotation angle between my two sets of axes. What I'm basically saying there is that if I take a transformation that does theta plus 90 degrees, that gives me this angle. You agree with that? So my strain along the y prime direction, I can get that just by taking uh, and plugging in for the theta that I have as my argument in this uh, expression or in the earlier one, if I want to use that one. Um, I can just plug in a value of theta plus 90 degrees if I want to get my strain along the y prime direction. Okay? Which, when I do that, um, it's, it makes kind of an interesting setup because um, I can then add my x prime and my y prime uh, strains. Okay? So let's say I take the expression here and I add it to the expression here. Okay, what do you see happens? Notice there my, my term that has a cosine of 2 theta in it. It's positive in one case and it's negative on the other case. So when I add them together, what happens to it? They go away. Okay, same thing happens for the term that has the sine of 2 theta in it, right? There's a positive for one of them, there's a negative for the other one. So when I add, they cancel, OK? And what we learn from this is that basically the only term we have left over in both cases is this term, which when I add those together, since it's half each time, it just gives me a whole uh, sum. And that you know, ultimately tells me here that my sum of uh, normal strains is independent of my rotation angle. Okay, It remains constant. The sum of my normal strains remains constant regardless of what my rotation angle is. That's a, not something that would necessarily be intuitive to, to just say, yeah, that would be true. right? Like That's something that's kind of cool that, that pops out of this, um, this discussion. All right, so, but that's not far enough yet. What we're trying to do, this is a step along the way, but what we're trying to do is come up with this other parametric equation uh, to, to actually be able to draw a circle based on this, um, you know, we're trying to basically create a circle that works a lot like more circle for stress, but is useful for strain. So here's the, the kind of the path that helps us get there. It's a little bit odd. What if we plug in a value of 45 degrees into my uh, strain transformation equation? Okay, 45 degrees is an interesting value because we have those factors of two in my trig functions, right? And so that means that when I multiply two times 45 degrees for my cosine function, that gives me a cosine of 90 degrees, and cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Right? When I take that and I do 2 times 45 degrees plugged into my sine function, that get, just gives me a 1. 
okay? And so it ends up telling me that if I'm evaluating strain along a 45 degree line, okay, that will just be one half of the sum of my normal strains and my shearing strain, okay? Where this ends up being used, you know, maybe a little bit more frequently than this, uh, you know, format of it is the next one, which it's the same equation. It just rearranged it to where it's solved for shearing strain. Okay. This tells me that if I can figure out my strain in the X, my strain in the Y, and my strain along a 45 degree line, then that allows me to figure out what my shearing strain is uh, in the X, Y. Right. Where do you think that might be useful? Okay, I'll tell you, it's useful for strain rosettes. And we're gonna get into that a little bit deeper here in just a few minutes. But a strain rosette is a collection of strain gauges, which are devices that can directly measure strain in a device and, or in a, in a part. You can glue these little uh, electrical pieces on there and based on their resistance changes, you can know what the strain is in the uh, in, in an element of material. Um, these are set up a lot of times to where you have two strain gauges perpendicular to each other and then one along a 45 degree line. And the combination of all that information gives you strain in uh, your two normal directions as well as your shearing direction. Okay, so we'll come back to that here in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, the next piece is, you know, this might be the trickiest one uh, to grab. So, you know, if you haven't already, you know, really engaged, engage right now. Um, the next piece is for us to understand that if we put ourselves in the perspective of the X prime, Y prime uh, set of axes. So let me actually make a little sketch of this. So that we have a, a little element of material. Okay, and you know I, I make my x prime, y prime axes. All right, and those are already rotated relative to the x axis and the y axis. Okay, by an angle of theta. Okay, what I want to point out here is that if I'm evaluating this shearing strain for x prime, y prime, and I'm doing it for, you know, kind of relative to my normal strains in the x prime and y prime, well then the equation wouldn't change. All you've done is you've just put it in the new set of coordinate system, or new set of coordinates. Do you agree with that? So in other words, if I kind of ignore that I ever had the x and the y, then it would make total sense that the strain along this 45 degree direction right here Okay, it would make total sense that you would figure that out just by taking the normal strains in the X prime and the Y prime, uh, as well as the shearing strain along the 45 degree line relative to those X prime, Y prime axes, right? And you could figure out what the, the normal strain was along that, or excuse me, the shearing strain was in the X prime, Y prime um, coordinate system. We good so far? Okay, <clears throat> so where this is actually a little bit tricky though, is I could also figure out what the uh, shearing strain was for the X prime, Y prime uh, direction if I evaluate it based on an angle that goes all the way from that line back to my original set of axes. Okay. Do you agree with that? I said, I'm not sure I get buy-in as much as, or as quickly on that, but it is true. So you basically, um, you, if you plug in a theta plus 45 degrees in there, you'll now get what that uh, normal strain is along that axis relative to the original x-axis. Right. All that is is you're just directly applying the uh, very first equation that we dealt with up here. 
and you're figuring out what the strain is now relative to the x and the y. OK? So if I now punch in, uh, or I, I kind of include um, you know, the, the evaluation of strain along that direction, I basically plug in theta plus 45 degrees into my um, you know, strain transformation equation that I had a few minutes ago. I think that was equation, what did I call it? Uh, equation 2 up there. Okay. It gives me this. Okay. Which this is actually now very interesting because, again, we have those uh, factors of 2. And so this ends up giving me 2 theta plus 90 degrees for the argument in this, um, uh, in that, you know, cosine function, and then 2 theta plus 90 degrees in the argument for that sine function. Okay. Well, what is the uh, plus 90 degrees? What effect does that have? Okay. Again, we have these uh, identities that allow us to turn a cosine of an angle plus 90 degrees into a negative sine of just the angle, right? And if we have uh, an angle plus 90 degrees in the sine function, you, and uh, you, know, you can turn that into a cosine function and get rid of that 90 degrees. Okay? So what that ends up giving us is this next expression. Keep in mind, this is, uh, this is just my shearing strain, normal shearing strain, along an axis that's defined by theta plus 45 degrees. OK? What I'm trying to get to is a shearing strain. OK? But notice up here that I have this expression that, uh, that relates my normal strain along that theta plus 45 degree direction to my shearing strain. OK. Good. And, uh, and so that ends up just giving me the expression that I have uh, down below there. And what you'll notice is that it became very important that my normal strains uh, are independent of my, my sum of my normal strains is independent of how much I've rotated my coordinate system. Because what that allows me to do is to cancel my sum of normal strains um, that I have for one question that I, or, or one of my expressions that I have up there, I, have, I can cancel that with my sum of normal strains in the other direction. Okay, and what that leaves me with is this gamma x prime y prime. And the last step here is just divide through this whole thing by 2. And what you'll see there is that that makes that expression look basically identical uh, to the other one that I had for my normal strains, with the exception of having that uh, term that is independent of angle. All right. And I know it's, it'd be a lot for me to ask you to remember exactly what the equations looked like that allowed us to derive more circle for stress to begin with. But I will just submit to you that this pair of equations has exactly the same form as the pair of equations that we used when we derived more circle for stress. Okay? If we plot these two equations parametrically where the parameter is that theta, and we let that theta vary through a full uh, rotation, then uh, you know it ends up giving us more circle. Okay, that means that we can use uh, all of the same like rationale that we used for more circle for stress, uh, and we can use that for strain, where the one tricky thing is what. I already mentioned it once. Okay, the one tricky thing is that we are not plotting uh, shearing strain directly. We're plotting half of shearing strain. Okay, But other than that, it works very much the same as uh, Moore's circle for stress. Okay, Now, at this point, um, 
I feel like it would be time for me to start answering a question, why would we care about strain transformations? Okay, so there's, there's sometimes, you know, you get some pieces of information, you go, well, that's all very interesting, but what do you do with it? Okay, and uh, I would say that to me, one of the most significant places where I think strain transformations are useful is in the, uh, is in the measurement of strain, okay? And uh, let me say it this way. It is very difficult for us to look at a part that is in service and it's being loaded and stressed. It's very difficult or maybe even impossible for us to look at it and know how much stress is at any point in the material that is being stressed. Like we don't have stress glasses that we can put on and just look at it and say, oh, here's where the high stresses are, okay? What do we have? Okay. One of the things we do have is we have these little devices called strain gauges, and strain gauges can be implemented in such a way that they can pretty accurately measure at a point in the, it's generally in the surface of a material. There are some cases where people have successfully implemented strain gauges in the body of a material rather than right on the surface. That's not typical. Usually what happens is uh, if you're going to have a strain gauge, it's going to be adhered to the surface of a part. And the strain gauge is able to actually give you direct feedback in service as to how much strain the material experiences. Okay? And based on that, then you as, a, you know, as an intelligent user of that system are able to go back and back calculate and figure out what the state of stress is in the uh, element of material where the strain gauge was adhered. Does that make sense? But it takes a little bit of analysis for us to really be able to use that. And that's what my next little segment here is going to be talking about is how do you deal with this strain gauge data? Okay. So that's what we get to down here. Okay. First of all, just uh, I think I mentioned this, but strain gauges are these little electrical devices that are set up so that as a piece of material strains, in other words, its length is changing because the material itself is stretching or being com compressed. Um, you glue one of these little devices to the material and as the material stretches or collapses, it actually does two things. The little trace of uh, electrical material on the, you know, on the strain gauge is caused, you know, that little piece of material is forced to stretch with the part that you have it glued to. And when it does that, uh, a couple of things happen. One is the length increases by a little bit, okay? And based on our resistivity, you know, this is a, an equation here, this R equal rho L over A, this is a way of finding resistance based on the resistivity of a material. So what you're doing there is you're increasing the L by a little bit. You're also decreasing A by a little bit. Why is that? Right, we talked about this last time, the idea that Poisson's ratio is going to actually cause this transverse strain. So the little trace of material has this transverse strain that reduces the area, okay? And then some of these um, actual compounds that they use to trace this, I think might have a little bit of, um, you know, there's something that reacts and, and causes the resistivity maybe even to change a little bit. Anyway, all that stuff is sort of the, the um, cause of why the resistance changes in a, uh, in a, sh a uh, uh, strain gauge. I don't know why it was so hard for me to remember the, the term strain gauge. But anyway, all those things go into what caused the resistance to change in a strain gauge, but it changes predictably with strain, right? And so we can hook these up to electrical instruments and the instruments can report to us how much strain is happening in a particular direction on a part where you have one of these things adhered. Okay, let me show you a couple of different configurations that are really common. All right, the first one I want to show you is called a rectangular strain rosette. All right, mentioned this earlier. Rectangular strain rosette just puts one strain gauge perpendicular to another strain gauge. All right, that gives you kind of your two uh, directions along like y and x and then puts one at 45 degrees and when he put that one at 45 degrees it allows you to not only have x and y 
but now you also have uh, a number that you can use to find shearing strain. So you can basically determine the entire state of stress at this little location in the material based on having this strain rosette uh, adhered to the material. Okay, and it's pretty easy to process, right? If you wanted to put this into some sort of a, you know, computer or program it in, you know, a lot of you use the Arduino, right? If you wanted to program all these things in, your, your Arduino could report to you the exact state of stress just based on these values that you put in. Okay, very easy to use. So one of the things is though, that um, even though this is easy to use, there is a configuration that's even better in other words, more potential for accuracy than the rectangular configuration. What do you think another configuration might be that might be a little bit better? Okay, if you look at, if you look at this configuration, you basically, one way of looking at it is that you have a 90 degree spacing from this strain gauge to this strain gauge, and then think about this other strain gauge kind of existing along an axis back here right? What's the uh, angle now between this strain gauge and that next one? This was 90. Over here now, how much is it? 135 degrees, which is also what it would be over here. Okay. Can you think of a reason why it's best to have two of them spaced at 90, you know, one of the spacings be 90 degrees and two of the spacings be 135 degrees? What do you think might be better? What if they were all equally spaced? Okay. And that, if you know, a configuration like that where they are all equally angularly spaced from each other is called a delta configuration. All right, we'll, we'll look at that just a little bit more. Um, here's the thing though. We can actually deal with this issue for any spacing that we want to between each of the strain gauges. Right? The only, the only rule is we can't have two of them parallel to each other because that doesn't give us extra information. Right? So as long as we have three unique you know, linear directions, then we can figure out what the total state of stress is and here's how you do it. Okay, you might remember this, this was an equation we had in the middle of our derivation just now. Right? This uh, equation for uh, normal strain along some random uh, rotation angle. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that can be used for each of our strain gauges. All right. So each of my strain gauges, I can, I can define what the angle is relative to X for each of my strain gauges. Sorry, there's a little page break right there. And what does that allow me to do? Okay, because keep in mind, what you're getting from these strain gauges, these strain gauges are reporting to you, hey, this strain gauge says there's some amount of normal strain happening at strain gauge three. Okay, this strain gauge is saying, I have a cer certain amount of normal strain that's happening at strain gauge two. And strain gauge one says, I have a certain amount of normal strain that's happening where I'm ad adhered. Okay. So that's where you put in the values. In other words, you know, whatever system you have that's doing this measurement, you have these three strains. What you want is strains that are reported to you along x, y, and then gamma x, y, right? Normal strains in the x, normal strain in the y, and then shearing strain in the x, y plane, OK? Well, what you can do is you can just apply this transformation equation to each of those setups. Okay, and what you'll notice there is um, we have epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three. Those are values that you get reported to you from the from the system. Um, you would also know what all of these angles were, right? You would know theta one, theta two, and theta three, which means you would know all of those numbers, right? Since you know those angles, you know you know all of those. Um, you also know all of these. And you also know all of these. Okay, what don't you know? You don't know your normal strain x, your normal strain y, 
or your shearing strain in the XY. But you have a system of three equations and three unknowns, and it's linear. So all you got to do is solve that system, and you can figure out what the um, strains are in each of those directions. Okay? So that's how we can deal with other types of strain rosettes, right? Kind of our general strain rosette equations. Just to give you a little idea, those are a couple of the different ways that they actually look. Okay? So the delta configuration there, you see that that's got a 120 degree spacing between each of these directions. Okay? One of the reasons it's called delta is that this configuration is not different than if the strain gauges were set up such that one of them was, say, along this way, and one of them was set up along this way, and another one was set up along this way. Well, I guess, let me, uh, let me make sure that I'm actually representing it accurately. It's not different than if I had one like this, one like this, and one like this. Okay. They're, they're shifted. You know, they're not rotated. They're shifted relative to that, but they're not rotated relative to that. Okay? And so that's maybe where this term of delta comes in. Okay? Um, this is one of the ways a rectangular rosette can be set up. Okay? You might see over here. In this case, you basically have like um, x, y, and then this would be along the 45 degree line. Okay. Um, when you get these actually implemented on a piece of material, it's actually very important if you want to have the data mean something to the designer. So a lot of times what's, what happens here is a prototype might be built of something that a designer is thinking about putting into mass production. They might make one prototype and then apply strain gauges to it and run it through its paces and make sure that they don't have stresses that they weren't accounting for somewhere in the material. All right. So if you want to accurately deliver information to the designer of the part, it's very important that you get your rosettes lined up in some known orientation so that it means something to you when you talk about your different directions. Right? We'll, we'll work a problem where that uh, may not have occurred All right, in just a few minutes. All right, one last little thing to get to here. And it is, OK, so what? You've got um, these strain gauges that might report these different strain values to you. Um, and you can then transform those strain values if you need to into x, you know, into different uh, other places. Or you, you, you can actually find uh, principal strains, right? I haven't talked about that just yet. But since you had principal stresses for Mohr circle, you also have principal strains uh, for Mohr circle for strain, OK? And once you know your principal strains, then that can actually be interfaced with the cube again, because your principal strains act along the same set of axes as your principal stresses. All right? And, and they relate to how the cube of material might stretch in any particular direction, right? It relates your stress and your strain for each of your three directions. Okay, well, let's actually, you know, maybe boil this down just a little bit more. Okay, we've already kind of talked here about the uh, strains in each of my principal directions and how they relate to stress. Okay, what if we have a state of plane stress? What happens if you have a state of plane stress? Which is, by the way, any place where you're going to adhere um, strain gauges to it's typically going to be in a state of plane stress anywhere where you glue strain gauges to. Why is that? All right, because it's a free surface. Right? You're typically not going to glue your strain gauges to a surface where some other force is coming in from the outside and pushing right on where the strain gauges are being adhered, right? which is where you would have to, you know, if there was going to be a stress in that direction, that's what it would have to be from. So since you have a free surface where you're planning on, on bonding your um, strain gauges, uh, it means that you're typically going to expect that you have a state of plane stress any place where those are bonded. Okay? And what does that do to this system of equations here? Let's say your, your, uh, you know, your C direction here, 
was the one that had zero stress. Right? Basically, this goes away, this goes away, and this goes away. Something that's interesting here is does epsilon c become 0? It does not, right? So in a state of plain stress, it does not mean that you have 0 strain in the direction where you have 0 stress. Why is that? That's because of Poisson's ratio, OK? Um, and the other thing that I'll say here is that uh, we typically can't directly measure um, the out of plane strain, right? We have this state of plane stress, but we're not directly measuring the out of plane strain of the little element of material. But what are we measuring if we're using strain gauges? Okay, we're going to be measuring in plane strains. Okay, so this is, this one down here is not measured. Up here, these are the outcome of a Mohr circle for strain analysis, right? If you do your Mohr circle for strain, you do that analysis, you can find principal strains. And based on those principal strains, you might be able to find some principal stresses. Okay, that's what I'm going to get into now down here. Okay. So I basically knocked out all of my um, out of plane stresses, and that gives me this little system. That's where I'm starting here. Okay. Now, what happens if we manipulate these in a certain set of ways? Okay. So, first of all, I'm going to solve uh, equation one for uh, sigma A, and then I'm going to solve equation 2 for sigma B. Okay. Now, if I do a couple of substitutions, I can solve for sigma A. Okay. Why is that helpful, do you think? Okay. What do I plug in, and what do I get? Okay. Yeah, I've got the principal strains that came out of my uh, Mohr circle for strain analysis, right? I plug those in here, and uh, these are just elastic constants, right? I just have my modulus of elasticity and my Poisson's ratio, and what do I get? A principal stress, okay? So this is a way to go to principal stresses if you have found principal strains, right? If we do this same you know, set of steps, but focus on getting sigma b instead of sigma a, okay, um, it allows us to do the same thing. What's the only difference between those two expressions? Okay, yeah, it's, it's which, one, which one of your principal strains is Poisson's ratio going to be applied to, right? It's really the only difference between the two expressions. Cool. Well, that gives me my, two of my principal stresses. One other thing that I should look at, and that is, how do I find my out-of-plane strain? As I said, I wasn't measuring it directly. How do I find my out-of-plane strain? OK. I basically plug these two expressions back into that third, you know, this guy right here, and then solve them out. And you end up seeing that that out of plane strain can be found with negative uh, Poisson's ratio over 1 minus Poisson's ratio times the sum of the in plane str uh, principal strains. OK? Interesting stuff, huh? All right, and that gives us a lot that we can work with when we get ready to do our example problem. Okay. Before I really start this example problem, 
Let me show you what this example problem applies to. Okay. I mentioned a few minutes ago that one of the ways that uh, systems can be designed is that you know, the designer that has some idea about how they might be putting together uh, a system of parts, they might do some initial calculations and say, here's what size I think all these things need to be. But often, if you're planning on producing a million of something, you know, let's say you're producing a million cars, and each of those cars is a you know, multiple tens of thousands of dollars that you have to spend you know, for each of those, um, it's worth spending a little bit of effort up front to try to make sure that your design was going to be adequate. So a lot of times after it's been designed, you might start producing some of these parts and you might do some strain gauge testing and make sure that places where you think you might have bad cases of strain uh, or stress that you're actually getting some sort of actual feedback from the actual part. And they, one way of doing that is to actually do these um, strain gauge analyses. So let me show you here one of these strain gauges. OK, let's look at that one right there. What do you see right there? OK, what kind of configuration is that? That's a delta configuration. OK, so it's got 120 degrees between uh, each of the three strain gauges. OK, you might see the three strain gauges there, uh, one right here, one right here, and one right there. OK. Um, so you've got 120 degrees between all of them. Let me ask you this. It's hard to say, like, I, I can't definitively say that this one was not bonded straight relative to the directionality of the piston that it's bonded to, but does it look straight? Does it look to you maybe like there's a little bit of angle of here relative to here? Okay, again, I don't have the part sitting in front of me. Just to make this kind of realistic, let's just go ahead and say, what if the person who was in charge of bonding these strain gauges to the piston, what if they didn't get it on there exactly straight? Okay, and just to make it interesting, let's say that he didn't get it on there straight, but that we were able to quantify how far off it was. Sound good? So let's say it's, it's eight degrees off of what it was supposed to be just to throw a number at it, OK? That's this problem right here, OK? So we're basically saying we wanted to know what the stresses and strains and everything were relative to x, y axes that I have identified right here. But it wound up that we were 8 degrees uh, angularly offset from where we wanted the strain gauge rosette to be. <laughs> Okay. The strain gauge rosette is applied to aluminum, so we know what kind of material it's applied to. And let's say that we, uh, you know, we're putting this into whatever kind of uh, stress that we're expecting it to be in, and when we do that, we are able to measure with our strain gauges uh, 820, and then here's, a, here's some notation you're probably not used to just yet. I say 820 with a little letter mu right there. What do you think that means? OK. So keep in mind, what are units for strain? Strain is unitless. OK. So strain has no units because it's length over length, right, is, is, what, uh, is how uh, strain is typically defined. All right. But we're used to using uh, little prefixes in terms er, in front of other you know, units quantities. And what is the prefix? If we're using this as a prefix on another unit, what does mu mean in that case? It means 10 to the negative 6, right? It's micro, all right? So that's basically what we mean here, is that um, strain gauge number 1 is reporting to us that we have 820 times 10 to the negative 6 as the strain that comes out of that. By the way, this is not uncommon for people to use this terminology when they're talking about strain. What they would typically speak when they say this is they've got 820 micro strain. Okay, 
even, I mean, that may not make total sense, but, you know, but that's not uncommon terminology to use whenever you're talking about this strain gauge information. Okay? And what it means is 820 times 10 to the minus 6 um, for that strain value. Okay? For uh, strain gauge 2, it's negative 150 micro strain. And then for strain gauge 3, you're getting 130 micro strain. Okay, what we're supposed to find are a few things. First of all, we need to find the strain in the x direction, y direction, and the shearing strain um, in the xy plane. Okay. Then what we need to do is use those pieces of information to find the in plane principal stresses using more circle for strain. All right. Once we've got that figured out, we're going to determine the out-of-plane strain. Then we're going to figure out what the principal stresses are. And then we will figure out what more, the more three-circle diagram looks like for stress. All right. So what's the first step? OK. It might be helpful for us to know the angles of each of these strain gauges, OK? Uh, and actually, before we even do that, let me actually go scroll way up here and go back and look at the equations that we're ultimately trying to use here to convert the strains that we have along each of our strain gauge directions into strains along x, y, and gamma x, y, right? So basically, uh, normal strains in the x and y, and then a shearing strain in the xy plane. OK? And to do that, we need all of these angles, all right? So I'll tell you what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to grab this um, and uh, take a little snip of it. So that way, we know what we're shooting for. OK? I'm going to drop that down here, because <clears throat> that's what we're shooting to, to try to find. Okay, and I like the suggestion that someone had that uh, we should probably find each of the angles associated with each of these strain gauges. Okay, which one do you want to start with? Okay, number one. And for number one, you know, one thing to note here is that we were trying to measure all of these angles relative to the positive x axis. Okay, so for number one, that's the angle that we're trying to find right there. And what is that angle? 98 degrees, which I believe was a boy band back in the day. Um, so that's, that's good for that one. That is going to be our theta 1. OK? Uh, what about our other angles? OK? Um, you know, hypothetically, you could measure them all positively from the, uh, from the x-axis, you know, positive counterclockwise around to each of these, uh, you know, items. But I want to show you something here. Uh, for strain gauge 2, I can actually draw a line along that, like the, the line of that strain gauge. And it wouldn't be any different than if I just measured this angle right here. OK. Now, what do you think that angle is going to be? Because I guess maybe I should talk about this for just a second. It doesn't matter if you take a strain gauge and you flip it around the opposite direction. It's just measuring strain, right? So whether you have it glued on you know, along the line one way or 180 degrees from that, it's not going to make a difference to the strain gauge, right? And that's why I can go ahead and extend that line and maybe have a little bit smaller uh, angle that I'm going to have to deal with. So what is the value of this angle going to be? Okay, well, it would start out if this was a, uh, a nicely aligned delta configuration strain rosette, it would start out at 30 degrees. But remember, what was one of our things that we are presuming happened here? Yeah, whoever stuck it on there stuck it on 8 degrees canted from what it was supposed to be. Okay, so what would this angle be? 38 degrees. Whoop. <clears throat> 
Okay, and then what about my other line? What do you think that line's gonna be? And again, you could, you could go all the way around the circle if you wanted to, or what's, a, what's an equivalent thing to do, you think? Okay, if you just measure this right here, and the value of that angle relative to the uh, x-axis there is just going to be negative 22 degrees. You see that? It says it would have started out at 30, but because we got this 8 degree cant, it basic, or, or negative 30, because we got this 8 degree cant, it uses up some of that negative 30 and it takes you back up to negative 22 degrees. All right. So how do I set up my equations now? Tell you what, I'll slide those down a little bit. What's epsilon 1? 820 micro strain, right? Remember that was, we talked about that a little bit. Okay, this is going to be equal to epsilon x, which is one of the things that we're trying to find. That's the strain along the x direction times the cosine squared of what? Okay, 98 degrees plus epsilon y times the sine squared of 98 degrees plus gamma xy times the sine of 98 degrees times the cosine of 98 degrees. Okay, and that's our first equation that we uh, get to use in terms of writing the system of equations to be able to find uh, strains along, you know, normal strains in the x and y and then shearing strain xy. All right. Um, I don't want to have to write this necessarily again each time because it's the same format of this uh, expression. And so I'm just going to copy and paste. Okay. What do I have to change? Okay. 820 is no longer 820. It's instead now we should change it to negative 150 micro strain. And then what with the angles? Okay. This will have to be 38 degrees. This will have to be 38 degrees, as well as these values over here. All right, now I got to do that one more time. <clears throat> And this time, we need to change the strain value to 130 micro strain. And then for my other values here, uh, we would have negative 22 degrees in each of these spots. OK. And this is a system of three equations and three unknowns that we can solve. And it's a, it is a linear system of equations because we don't have higher orders of any of the things we don't know. All the things we don't know are just first order. They're not multiplied by each other. They're not squared. Right? They are just first order terms. Okay? So that means we can just punch in the coefficients if we have a calculator that will do this uh, because you guys are probably fully familiar with how to do that. I will spare us the time uh, spent on that. And instead, I will just say here what this turns out to be is that uh, epsilon x ends up being negative uh, 220.7 micro strain. Uh, epsilon y ends up being 754 micro strain. And our shearing stra strain in the xy plane uh, ends up being negative 615.8 microstrain. Okay?
And because I don't want to uh, just move straight into the next thing just yet, let me actually take these results that I just found and let's kind of imagine what this means must be happening to an element of material. Imagine, you know, these strain gauges are all applied to this little element of material right here. Okay. So let's imagine for a second what these strains mean in terms of what's going on in that element. And we'll exaggerate all of these deflections so that it kind of makes sense to us. So let's start by showing that element. Okay, this is the original kind of square shaped element. What happens along the x direction? Okay, along the x direction, we expect that it will have been compressed by some little amount. Okay, so where it may have started uh, the shape that we see here, maybe it will now be compressed, gotten a little bit smaller along that x direction because I have a negative strain. Okay, what else? Okay, elongated along the y, right? So along the y, we now expect that maybe it has gotten a little bit longer that way. Okay, and what else? Okay, now it's also skewed because I have this shearing strain term of negative 615.8 micro, right? What direction is that? Okay, yeah, kind of skewed to the left. Someone says, you know, as you move further up, it moves further to the left. Okay, so let me sketch that uh, here as well. Okay, what that kind of says here is that you basically have an element that starts doing something like this. Okay, and one of the ways that you uh, can sort of verify this, okay, this is kind of the, the new shape of the thing. One of the ways you can verify this is that is also the direction we would have identified a negative, negative shearing stress, right? It would have been that direction relative to our X and Y axes, okay? All right, so that's what the element is doing. Um, and uh, kind of keep track here, right? We've just now figured out what these uh, strains are according to our X and Y axes. And here I'm looking, I think I may have actually made a mistake that I didn't notice till just now. What do you think I meant to ask for here? Yeah, that, I meant to write strains right there and I wrote stresses. Apologize for that. Okay, we want in-plane principal strains, okay, using more circle for strain. So why don't I do more circle for strain, uh, just uh, maybe over here to the left. And I'll draw my normal strain axis right here. Okay. All right, so that's my normal strain axis. And uh, what do I do with it? Okay, I'm gonna have to deal with my, uh, my values of strain here. Um, and it looks like I have 754, 220. How big do you think I should make these squares? Okay, one way you can kind of check on this is you can say that it looks like it ranges uh, by about 900 and uh, about 970 or so. All right, so how, how big should I make my squares? Tell you what, I'll just make them, I'll make each square 100 micro strain. It'll be easy enough to sketch that. It'll be, end up being kind of small, but I think it'll still get the point across. Okay, so let me go ahead and it looks like I probably need more space to the right than to the left. So I'll put my uh, zero axis right here. And where should I plot my uh, normal strain uh, verticals. Okay, I should put one at 754, right? So one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, and a half or so. Okay, this is my 754 uh, micro strain. And then I have another one there at negative 220. Okay, so one, two, and a little bit there. That's my negative 220.7 micro strain. Okay, and let me label these axes as well. This is for normal strains, and this up here, what am I plotting here, you think? Okay, what I have to plot on my vertical axis is not shearing strain, it is half of shearing strain. Okay, you gotta be careful with this. You might remember, we'll go way back up here again and remind ourselves. Um, our equations that actually generated more circle to begin with had this uh, gamma xy over two and gamma xy over two in this spot right here. And that means that it basically, we're not really plotting gamma, we're plotting gamma over two on that vertical axis. Okay, so that's what I, how I'm gonna label that down here. Okay. So now what? I also have my gamma xy term of negative 615.8. Uh, and so that basically means I need to plot half of that up and half of that down. Do you agree with that? So, you know, that would be roughly 300 and eight or so um, micro strain. So I try to plot that. Um, let's, let's look at the 754 micro strain first. Should I go up or should I go down? Okay. Let me do this. Okay. Let me do it this way. Let me because okay, you can learn rules like if you've got a shearing stress acting on that face, then you should go clockwise or go counterclockwise. You can learn rules like that, but what I think is more valuable is to actually understand the geometry and to why you have to plot it where you do. Okay, so let me go back to this uh, element right here because I think this element can be instructive about why we need to plot them the way that we do. Okay. Let's go into a place where we imagine that we don't have any shearing strain. So what if we had the normal strains uh, in the X and Y that I identified right here, but we don't have any shearing strain, okay? Where would you have said my worst case normal strain was, like my, my furthest positive normal strain? Before I consider any of my shearing strain. I think most of you would probably say it would be along the y-axis, right? That's where I've got my largest positive strain is along my y-axis. But now that you've said that, you say, okay, if there was no shearing strain, that's where it would be. Now let's add shearing strain into the question, okay? Because we're saying we think there might be a spot where there's more normal strain than what we identified having ignored the shearing strain. And what axis you know, do you, along which do you think that would actually increase, right? What do you think? Like what direction would I, have, would I have to rotate this way or would I have to rotate this axis this way in order to find an axis where I had even more normal strain than the one I just, okay, counterclockwise, right? So if I was to put another axis on here that was canted over a little bit like this way, right? the presumption is that I would end up with more normal strain along that axis than I would along my y-axis. Would you agree? Because of the shearing strain? Okay, and that's correct, right? That's, that is what's going on along that axis. Okay, and so um, what you need to sort of, you know, recognize here is that what we plot as far as our original points that we put on our more circle for strain or stress, what we're plotting is the stress components that we're actually given. And what we need to think about is we go from there and what we usually are trying to find are principal stresses or strains, 
right? And those are the locations where we actually have our maximums, okay? So what I'm saying here is that the, the green axis is kind of like the axis that's given to us. What direction do we have to go to get to where it's actually maximum? Counterclockwise. Well, that should be the same as on the diagram that I'm drawing right here, okay? So where I draw my initial points, I'd better have to rotate counterclockwise from there to get to where my actual maximums are for my, for my uh, normal strains, okay? So what does that mean in terms of like where I should plot my shearing strain value for um, the 754 micro? You should have to plot it below. And I said it was you know, maybe a little bit more than 300 or so, right? You should have to plot that one below and you should have to plot this one above. Okay, and I know that took a long time to explain all that, but I think that's actually more valuable for you to understand it that way than to just memorize a rule as far as, you know, if you have this, then do that, right? Personally, I think it's actually helpful to memorize both ways so that you can use both of them and make sure they both agree, right? And if either one of them disagrees, then it forces you to look at it a little bit longer and make sure you really understand it, okay? So what we do once we plot those two values is we draw a line. Okay, and that line represents the state of stress or the uh, stress components we're actually given. And what we're trying to do is figure out these principal strains. Okay, now how do we do that? All right, kind of the way we think about this is we know how we can find where this center is of more circle for strain, right? How do I figure out where that is? Okay, what you do is you take the average between your two normal strains, okay? So you just basically take, uh, what were our values here, 754, micro strain plus a minus 220.7 micro strain over two, okay, then what? Plus or minus the radius of this circle, all right? And you find the radius of the circle basically by understanding that you have a little triangle that's set up where one leg of that triangle is half of the shearing strain, all right? That's this over here. Okay, and then the other leg of the triangle is what? Half of the difference between your normal strains, right? So uh, something like this, okay? That's the two sides of that triangle. And since it's a right triangle, we find the radius just with the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so the Pythagorean theorem then says that I would take, um, okay, 754 micro, okay, minus a minus 220 uh, micro strain, all this over two, and that whole thing should be squared. Okay, and then what? Plus, what else? Okay, gamma xy was negative 615.8 micro strain over two, that squared. Okay. And when you plug those values in, what you get is, okay, and the plus and minus gives you the, the one that's, you know, over here and the one that's over there. That's the two values it gives you. So what this, what comes out of here is 843.06 micro strain 
and negative 309.76 microstrain. Those are two of my principal strains. Okay, uh, These are what we would call my in-plane principal strains. Okay, And those are very helpful. How? Okay, where do we use those? Okay, the next thing it actually asks for there, it says find the in-plane principal strains, okay, using more circle for strain. We just did that. Now we need to find the out-of-plane strain. Do we have a, an equation for that? OK. We do. We can scroll up here and find it. As a matter of fact, we didn't have to scroll that far. This is our equation for finding our out-of-plane strain, given that we now know our in-plane principal strains. OK. But what do we need? We need a Poisson's ratio, right? So minus Poisson's ratio over 1 minus Poisson's ratio, OK? OK, so at what is the Poisson's ratio for aluminum? OK, 0.333 is what it winds up being for aluminum. Uh, that comes from table A5 in the back of the book. This goes over 1 minus. 0.333, okay, times, what was it? The sum of my principal strains, my in-plane principal strains. Okay, so 843.06 micro uh, plus a minus 309.76 micro. Okay, and what this gives me is negative 266.25 micro. Now, real quick, before I leave this point, did we have any kind of a principle uh, about how our two in-plane uh, normal strains, you know, how those behaved when you rotated your coordinate axes? Anyone remember anything like that? What did the sum of our in-plane principal strains do, or not even principal strains, our in-plane strains do as we rotated our coordinate axis? They stay the same, right? We can go way up here and remember early in our discussions up here, way, way up here, we had this result that happened that basically said, as you rotate your coordinate system, your sum of your normal strains stays the same. OK? So if you end up in a place where you're just supposed to find that out of plane strain, and you don't want to have to do all this work with more circle, and there's nothing else that you need to find either, what should you do? OK? You don't have to do more circle, right? If you just take your X strain and your Y strain and you plug in 754 micro right here and minus 220.7 uh, micro right there, this will give you the same result. OK, so just make a note of that um, so that in case you're trying to save yourself some time, uh, trying to find an out-of-plane strain, and you don't want to have to go through all the process of finding your principal strains, you can avoid that. Sound good? OK, so let's see what's next. So that's our out-of-plane strain. Next, we need to find principal stresses. OK, how do I do that? So we got some equations up here, right? We got those two equations. We got elastic modulus over 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared times the principal strain in the direction you're curious about, 
plus the other principal strain times Poisson's ratio. Okay, so that's the equation that we need to essentially use down here. Okay, so uh, let me call this one uh, sigma sub one. And I'm going to put in here the elastic modulus for aluminum, which again can be found in table A5 in the back of the book. It turns out that that's 10.4 MPSI. over, uh, and then down here I do 1 minus Poisson's ratio, and that is a squared value, multiplied by the strain that I want in this direction, which is 843.06 micro, okay, plus Poisson's ratio times my strain in the other direction, negative 309.76 micro. OK. And once I punch those values in, this ends up giving me uh, 8654.78. PSI. Okay, so a quick little note here about our units. Okay, I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about them, so let me just discuss them right now. I have MPSI on the left, right, or the left part of the, uh, the expression. What is MPSI? 10 to the 6, right? What is micro? 10 to the minus 6. So those cancel. And so you can end basically just punch these values in just like they are. And you don't have to worry about them because the units offset. OK? All right, so that's my first principal stress. How do I find my other principal stress? OK, like before I get into the, the, uh, you know, the one that I do with my other equation, right? my other equation being, uh, you know, the same other than the fact that I swap my two in-plane strains, right? It's going to be the same. Do you think that's going to give me a positive or negative principal stress? Someone says negative. Why do you think it'll probably end up negative? OK, I would guess negative as well. And I'd guess negative because I have a negative strain in that direction that's not really insignificant. Right. Now, you can't necessarily completely do that because you have the issue of transverse strain that you could end up having. Um, you know, so it's not always that way. But if you have some you know, reasonably significant amount of strain in that direction, you can probably expect that your stress is also going to be you know, compressive in that direction. Okay? So I'm going to expect it's going to be compressive. And why do you think I'm talking about that? It has to do with my labeling of my three different stresses. Okay. Yeah, I'd probably actually want to call this sub 3 rather than sub 2. Why do you think that is? Because one of my stresses, because I, you know, what state of stress is this? This is a state of plain stress, right? Because, you know, we don't have anything on this surface. It's a free surface, right? So when you have a free surface and no other loads acting on it, it means that you've got a state of plain stress. And so, um, I'm going to say here that sigma 2 is 0, okay? whereas sigma 3 is probably going to turn out negative. All right, so we'll go ahead and plug this in, 10.4 MPSI over 1 minus 0.333 squared. And now we punch in negative 309. 0.76 micro plus 0.333 times 843.06 micro 
Okay. And when I uh, enter those, it ends up giving me negative uh, 339.46. And again, those units cancel with the micro and the mega PSI. All right, so that takes care of my three principal stresses. And let's see what else we were supposed to do for this problem. It says, do a more three circle diagram for stress. Okay. So let me set that up. Okay, let's say that uh, I'll just do 100 PSI is a, is a division here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a half or so. Right, that's one of my spots. Okay, where's another spot? Okay, that's my 8654.78 PSI. Okay, what's another spot? Okay, another one's zero. And another one is negative 339. Okay. So let's see here. Oh, I was doing these at 1,000, wasn't I? Not 100. It's OK. So that means how far over is this little point? Not very far at all, right? Like right there. OK, so that's like my other spot. So now how do I draw this diagram? I've got a little circle over there, right? And I've got this big circle over here. And then a slightly bigger circle around the whole thing. Something like that. And if you have drawing tools at your disposal, I would encourage you to use them. You know, if you have a compass or a you know, set of templates or something like that, it can really make these make more sense if you can draw them as, as cleanly as possible. Okay, so that, you know, this value right here is zero, and this value over here is negative 339.46 PSI. All right. And just to kind of tie a bow on it, um, why this is helpful, right? I think we talked about this a little bit, but we started this problem kind of in the context of what if you're trying to investigate near the head of a piston, right? You're trying to figure out on that location um, what some maybe some real stress values are in service, right? And you might not know even the directionality of those stresses or sort of what that stress tensor would look like at a particular element of material. And so if you implement one of these strain gauges on there, you can essentially answer that question. And now you know what the state of stress is like at that particular location, and that might help you uh, in determining a few things. One, like whether or not it's too much. But then the other thing is, you know, it might give you some clues as to how you might be able to change the geometry to make the state of stress uh, less damaging perhaps. So uh, that's kind of the big idea there. Any questions? Okay, so the question is for the out of plane principal strain, does that mean we have deformation in an axis that is perpendicular to the page here? And the answer to that is yes. Okay. The reason for that deformation that's happening in the material uh, that's sort of out of this plane is because of the transverse strain effect, right? Which is what Poisson's ratio uh, 
is meant to try to handle, right? Poisson's ratio says for a certain amount of strain that you have in the direction that you're actually pulling, you will have some other amount of strain that will cause your material to collapse in the opposite direction, okay? And that is happening on the surface of the material. Uh, as you begin to strain it in one direction, it'll strain the opposite direction. And uh, where this is, it's not so much that this is useful to figure out like what the new size is of the piston or anything like that, but it is useful to understand that the strain is really what the material is feeling, right? Like it's useful to understand that the material has actually collapsed a little bit, the material itself. Like if you were able to go at a atomic level or something, and you're seeing little particles of material, you will have actually seen that material you know, decrease in size along that transverse direction. And that's, you know, it's helpful to understand that. And that's the main reason why we might want to know what that out of plane strain would be. Yes, ma'am. How would you go about calculating a shearing stress? Okay, how would you go about calculating a shearing stress in this case? Um, so that is, uh, that might be a little bit trickier, but it's actually not that bad, right? Because what you can do is um, now that you have all of your principal stresses, right? Um, you actually know that between this one over here and this one over here is your in-plane principal stress, right? You also know what the angle was, or you, can, you haven't calculated it, but you can figure out what this angle is on the Mohr circle for strain. That angle will match the angle that you would have on Mohr circle for stress. Okay, because they're actually, you know, what you're doing is you're just rotating coordinate system, right? And we know that the X and Y coordinate system are what they are, right? It's, they're not stress or strain dependent. And the principal stress and strain axes we know match each other. So any rotation that we have to do with the, uh, the strain question is the same rotation we would have to do for the stress question. Okay, so that's how you could figure out what that stress value was is by just you know using the same angle yeah is the angle for the strain more circle also twice the actual angle that the element rotates yes it is okay yes so the question there was is the angle on more circle for strain is it double uh, what the physical angle is for the element just like it was for more circle for stress the answer to that is yes, and the way that you know that the answer to that is yes is by going up and looking at the formulas that created the circle to begin with, okay? And you notice here that we have that factor of two in all of our arguments for our cosine and sine functions, which those are the things that are doing the business of creating that circle with those parametric equations, right? So. You know, again, it works the same way where there's a factor of two difference between the angle for um, more circle for strain relative to what it is for the element. Okay, good questions. Anything else? What was that theta in the equation you just the theta describes the rotation angle to a new set of coordinates, right? So what that would describe if you were trying to describe a rotation on the element, right? That would basically be that angle. Okay, so let's say we're, you know, figuring out what that set of axes is right there. You could figure out what this angle was and that would be your theta to a new set of axes, right? And whatever that theta is that I find right there, it's going to have to be two times that right here. Yep. OK, and that's if we're specifically trying to find the principle to the principal direction, right? But the, the uh, idea of just doing these rotations, you can do rotations to places that are not the principal uh, set of axes. It's just that's our most common thing that we usually deal with. Okay?